Hi there, Tribers. How's everybody today? I don't see anyone on the chat yet, so we'll just sit and have a coffee together for a minute while waiting for everyone to join. Um, today we are uh, looking at um, uh, Technique Tuesday. So um, I thought about it a little bit and wondered what techniques might be of interest to you guys. And so I've come up with a few goodies for today that I think might be um, of benefit, especially to a lot of you who um, have been following along in, in this open studio. Hi, Judy. And um, uh, Maria, hello. And so anyway, so I thought I would um, show you a few things around my studio that I often consider my, hi Meg, my, my it's like my, my productive work. So it's, it's not, um, it's, it's the necessary part. Hi Denise, hi Meg, it's the, the um, parts of the studio that, I mean, it's not gonna be as boring today as painting edges or anything like that. Um, but I am gonna show you some techniques that are super valuable. Hi Sophie, um, for working on your, um, on your pieces. So if any of you have been painting a long time, um, and even those of you who have just been joining me since the beginning of this open studio at, uh, during lockdown time, you've probably started to notice that you've developed a lot of material, a lot of um, um, underpaintings, a lot of paintings, a lot of uh, sample pieces, a lot of started pieces, a lot of trial and error. Um, so w there is a step in between uh, the beginning and then the finished piece. And so a few things that I do, I'm gonna show you a few tricks from my studio today. Um, hi, Margo. I'm gonna show you a few tricks from my studio today that I do often in my, uh, hi, Alona. Alona's gonna appreciate this workshop today. Um, Technique Tuesday is about um, streamlining your practice or trying to eliminate all the half finished paintings and all that stuff. So um, join me as I show you some of the things that I, I gathered from my studio today um, that might be of interest. So these, if you guys recognize these, if you joined me last week, these were the backgrounds that I made while I was at the store. And so I wanted to show you how you go from backgrounds that you've made um, elsewhere, like if you're on vacation or if you're at somebody's house, like I know Denise right now is outside of her own studio in this lockdown. So working on paper is fantastic. And like I showed you, I just worked out of an old book and work directly on the paper. So it's, um, and then the trees and the things like that were able to come through that paper or yeah, through the image that was already on the background. And then the other background that I had made, hi Linda, the other background that I had made was just on a piece of paper from um, a, a notepad. So that's another thing that I'm going to uh, show you what to do with today. And then I have a few other things that I grabbed to show you because I work a lot on paper, but sometimes they're backgrounds, sometimes they're beginnings of paintings. Um, I'm gonna show you what I do with them when I have all these papers. Um, I also have prints because I do some printmaking. And so when I have these, um, they're like this is a huge process to do this and so this would be more to me of a finished piece with a little bit of addition or something other than um, you know a complete background so and then there's collage paper which I'll throw aside for now more printmaking and here's a poster so I want to show you what to do if you buy posters or something like that, more commercial art, or if you, if you take the art out of a, a, an old painting or something like that, um, you know, something you've bought that's been framed, you can take that out and use that. And then what else do I have here? 
that's it for now. So I just wanted to show you that the um, the notepad that I had done that artwork on before, those backgrounds before, was um, bought at the dollar store. So it's really not like I'm working on great papers or anything like that. Oh, I have one more painting to show you. So this giant piece is kind of like what we're doing on Friday, the let loose. And morning, Jen, morning, Rhonda. Um, yeah, this is more like from the let loose stuff. So you can see I've cut lots of chunks out because I actually use this stuff a lot. So um, this in a nutshell is kind of what we're going to be doing on Friday. And so whether you end up working on paper or something like that, you will be able to cut it up and then use it as like hundreds of other paintings after that, depending how large you go. Um, so yeah, so before I get too involved with, um, you know, all the possibilities, let's just start and do one. I can show you what to do with it. So I paint a lot on paper um, because I have, I have several options. So when I made the backgrounds the other day, I could actually just flatten this under a board or something like that by spraying it with a bit of water and then put a board or even a canvas, not a canvas, a wooden cradle panel on top of it and have it nice and flat and then weight it down. And then after a day or so, it'll be nice and, uh, and flat. Um, but for my purposes, these aren't too terribly um, bent. So I'm just gonna show you how I'm going to adhere them to boards. So they don't always need to be adhered to boards. Um, you can continue working on paper. So I know a lot of people who, um, because they're prolific, like me, we work a lot on paper. And then if it needs to be moved into like an encaustic painting or something like that, then we'll mount it to a board and I'll show you how to do that properly. But if not, like if it's just gonna be a mixed media piece, then I'll actually continue to work on the paper and then trim up my edges and things like that and get it to uh, uh, more of a standard size and crop it back. And then I'll actually just mount that onto a piece of um, mat board and then put it into a portfolio book in a sleeve. And then that way I'll sell it like that so that uh, you have work on paper. And hi, Emmy, and a lot of people, um, a lot of galleries and such too they enjoy having works on paper because it takes up less room and then if you're doing shows and things like that it just gives you an additional way of selling a lot more art um, because you don't have to mount everything you don't have to hang everything you don't have to frame everything and for me it's very satisfying to have lots of art on paper but i don't know that maybe that's just me so let's mount it to a board first and we'll go from there. So I'm just gonna see what panels, I am so running out of supplies, it's not even funny. Um, so I am reduced to eight by eight. Let's see how that looks. No, too small. Um, or six by six. So let's work on the six by six and um, with one of the sections of the background. So I'm gonna turn this down so that you guys can see a little bit better what I'm doing. Um, but at the same time, I'll be able to peek in and say hi. So I'm going to frame this up, not that it really matters. Um, let me look at this one with the trees. No, I think that's better suited to a bigger piece. So actually, yeah, no, that's fine. I'll work on this one. There's a lot of texture on this one from last week and I like it. So um, it doesn't really matter where I plunk it, but to look at it, I would just kind of frame it up, see where I want it to be. And then I'll put this on, put the panel face down and then you have a couple options. You can just trace it with your pencil and then take your straight edge and cut it out. Or you can just take a knife and then cut around the outside. So for those of you just tuning in, what we're doing on Technique Tuesday is we're going from 
when you've worked on backgrounds or um, paintings on paper, how to mount them to boards, how to treat them as paintings, how to continue with that way. So I didn't even cut all the way through. That was bad. Let me go back and try that again. If I can find a straight edge, I'll do that. Paint stick. So I have so much paint on here, I didn't even cut through it. That's a little bit better. So remember, if anybody was watching last week, when I was making this at my store, um, I just gooped on the paint and they were so wet and so heavy. Well, now that they've had time to dry, now I have all these great papers that remember you can photocopy them and use your own backgrounds again and again and again. But the beauty of having the original is it's got all this great texture and stuff to it. You see all those little circles and everything? Hi, Pam. It's got all that great texture and stuff. So that's a really good spot for all the um, little nooks and crannies for all the paint to seep into. So I'm going to take this now and then I'm going to do, um, can anybody guess? One sec. All right, thanks for your patience. Okay, you guessed it, glue to glue, right? So I've got my mixture here of my wallpaper paste and my white glue. I'm just gonna give it a little stir. There we go. And so the first thing I'm gonna do, I am absolutely gonna coat the back of this paper so that it really absorbs in. I need a nice, good coat. There we go. Because the paper is, is really um, absorbent, right? And so is the wood surface. So we're gonna do a nice, good here. So remember your background doesn't have to fit your board, but it is better if your background is bigger than your board. So for that reason, I was able to cut one section out of this, right? And now I have all these other pieces that I can use on other pieces. And um, so when I'm making backgrounds, I try to work on big paper as big as I can, and then I'll cut them up. So now, with glue to glue, right, glue to glue, now I'm going to use a brayer. So if you don't have a brayer, um, if you aren't all baking at home right now, you can use your rolling pin. But if you are gonna use a rolling pin, just make sure you put, because um, you see how gross they get? Right, so with paint and glue and everything else, just make sure you put parchment paper or wax paper or saran wrap or something on top to prevent the guck from getting all over your rolling pin. So what I'm going to do, so Emmy says, do you mix wallpaper paste with white glue to extend it or for another reason? Okay, so maybe you missed that in a previous one. So I actually add the white glue because wallpaper paste is strippable these days. So what that means is if you wallpaper your walls, how do you make it not wrinkle? Okay, I'll get back to that question in one sec. So um, the wallpaper paste is, um, there we go. The wallpaper paste itself is is uh, can be reactivated. So what that means is that, and it's the wallpaper is strippable. So when you have wallpaper on the wall, if you soak it with water, pull the wallpaper back off. So for collage in with our purposes once we put the um, the paper on we're going to go back in with water soluble paints and with acrylics and with chalk paints and with clay paints and with all these paints that have water in them and baby wipes and everything else and what that's doing is that's loosening your glue it's making it strippable so our paper is not actually bonded to the surface if we don't add a little bit of glue. So I add a little bit of white glue or Mod Podge, ideally, to it so that it will, once it dries, it's actually stuck there more permanently than if I hadn't done so. So that's that question. And then Tracy asked, how do I make it not wrinkle? Um, 
So I'm not quite sure how do I make what part not wrinkle. So I'll answer that question. I just need a bit more clarity. Now I'm going around and I'm just wiping off the excess glue. So if you're being miserly, you could totally just take that off with your finger and put it back in. And otherwise, you might just want to take it off with your paper towel so it's not all sticky on your fingers. Now that has to be let dry. So that's why when I'm working on paper and I attach things to boards, I usually do a whole bunch at one time and then I just get all my boards ready. That's why when I'm able to do a demo for you guys, when you made the background, mine all wrinkled when they dried. Yeah, mine did too. I just sprayed them with water on the back before I started here today. So good point. So yeah, so when your papers go wrinkly, what you, they're just dry, obviously, right? So what you need to do is spray them with a little bit of water, just a spray bottle. Let me show you. Just give it a good spray on the back. And then if you have something to weight it down great, then you lay it down flat onto, um, onto a flat surface, a countertop, anything like that. And then um, I usually put a piece of wax paper or something on to prevent it from sticking to whatever I'm putting on top. And then I'll put something flat on top, like a cutting board or whatever, or another panel or something like that, that's gonna cover it turn that down so I'll put something flat on it and then I weight that down and then I just leave them there and then once they dry then they're all smooth again so um, yeah so that's all it is to it so but but I didn't have a great um, amount of time because I completely forgot about doing these um, getting like get leaving them weighted so all I did before starting today was I just sprayed them with water so and that relaxes the fibers totally so now that we have this mounted to the board, we're gonna let that dry, okay? So I'll put that one aside and then we'll work on the next thing. So like if you wanted to just work on paper, that is entirely possible as well. So what I normally do when I'm working on paper, there we go, is I would use a straight edge and I would actually um, probably tape off or or um, yeah, maybe just tape off in this case. I've already cut this chunk out, so let me use the other one. That makes it a little bit easier. So I don't know what size this is, but it's probably not standard anything because I just took this out of a book, right? So now that we have this one from last week, you can see it's also curling. So I'm just gonna put some water on it to flatten it out. This must have been a good quality book because the pages are sealed. You can see the water beads off rather than soaking in. So I might even spray the front a little bit. There we go. Okay, so if I'm working on paper and I don't know the size of my image, I might want to try and mask off using tape um, a standard size. So the reason I would do that is because if I'm, if I'm going to be selling it as a... Um, as a finished piece. If it's an awkward size, meaning I didn't measure this or anything to begin with, if it's an awkward size, it doesn't fit in a standard frame and then people have to get it custom framed. So people usually get a little bent out of shape about stuff like that. So a selling point um, is that it can fit into a standard frame. So if you do measure it, um, and then if you don't know what standard frame measurements are, just go online and look them up, but they're you know 11 by 14 or whatever. So um, I don't actually think I even own a ruler in here. Yes, I do. One sec. Okay, so... I have a quilter's ruler, but I'm not sure if that's, yeah, it actually has measurements on it. I have lots of straight edges, but I just know that I don't have a lot of rulers. So I'm gonna look at here and an eight by 10 is a standard size and an eight by, a, oh, no, less than eight by 10. That's very standard, right? So I could mask it off or I could cut it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna cut it just so that 
you guys will be able to see the whole process. So I'm going to mark this off at 10 and at 10. And then should I decide later that this needs to, I don't know, become an encaustic painting or I want to mount it or whatever, then I have a standard size. I can just go and buy um, a panel and I can mount it to it and I don't have to worry about um, having a custom board made or cut to fit. There, so I'm just cutting off that excess piece. That was 10 that way, and I'm going to go 8 this way. And I'll probably leave most of those trees, so I'll cut off this side. 8. 8. If I have three points marked on here, it'll make it easier for me to line this up. And then I can just cut along my lines. Sorry, that might be pretty loud with a microphone on. Okay, there we go. Eight by 10. There. Now the nice thing about working on a panel as opposed to working on paper is that we have our edges to work with, right? So you can go kind of like off the edge, you can, you can wrap around if you have too much paper or too much paint. When you're working on your table or whatever it is, you don't have that advantage. So I generally will just take a different piece of paper, even from the same pad, and I'll put it on top and then I'll actually just work right on there. So for the meantime, what I'll do is take a few pieces of tape, any kind of tape, but painter's tape works really well if you don't want to have any troubles taking it off. Secure my edges. That way if I paint right off to the edge, like I said, it's not going to be a big deal. What happens if we have borders, like defined borders, is sometimes we get a little like, oh, I have to stay away from the edge. So this way we don't have that fear. There we go. So now I'd continue to work on this painting from this perspective, and then I would take it off of here. I would mount it to a piece of um, either foam core or uh, mat board that fits inside those standard sleeve portfolio books. And then, so I would take it off there, mount it to that very lightly with double-sided tape, put the title, the price, all that good stuff on it. And then that way, when somebody buys it, you just take it right out of the sleeve and there they go. And if you actually have additional plastic sleeves, then you could just put it back into a, another sleeve outside of your portfolio book. And then that way they could actually see the painting and then put it back into a plastic sleeve and take it home. So it's a great way of, of presenting your art. It's also a great way to practice art because not every painting that we're going to make is going to be, um, you know, destined for a show or something like that. So, um, so I tend to work a lot on paper and then I get to pick and choose later on which ones are going to make the cut of what I'm working on next. So that's um, another tip I wanted to show you. Okay, so that's two things we've done. We've worked on, on the panel, right? We've attached the paper to the panel. And then now, this is not fully dry yet, but I wanted to sh address what you do with your edges. Um, this one we've attached to paper. So now we have a painting ready to go. Denise says, I have some oil and cold wax backgrounds. What would be the next step if I don't want to continue in oil and... Come on, see more. It says see more, but it's not letting me... Oh yeah, cold wax, okay. Um, so unfortunately, Denise, I can't give you too much... Um, I'm not the cold wax queen. I've never, uh, I, I've played with cold wax, but I haven't taken any workshops in it and things like that. I imagine that the properties are very similar to um, encaustic, right? Because of the oil. So you would basically, 
Remember fat over lean, and that is an oil painting technique in that fat means it's an oil-based product, right? And then lean is a water-based product. So fat over lean always tells you that your fat can go over lean, but it's never lean over fat. So um, I'm always pushing these boundaries with chalk paint and clay-based paints because they stick really well. So I tend to use them a lot on top of my, um, my encaustic paintings and if I have anything oil, but really you would just, your, your only thing would be to experiment at this point and just try. I would not recommend covering an entire board with, um, with paper, if that's what you're asking. Um, you're just asking a lot of that glue and things to hold on to that, to that um, fat-based product, right, to the oils. So I'm not sure I would go that route. Um, but today specifically what I'm talking about is not about mediums and that sort of thing. It's more about what to do when you work on paper and you make your backgrounds and things like that. So, um, so I'll move on and I'll go to the next um, things that I do. So those are two things I do with paper. And then the third thing is this is from um, like what we're doing on Friday's workshop, right? Ooh, it looks like big scary eyes. Um, what we're doing on Friday's workshop is letting loose. So this, I can show you up close, is turned out to be a fantastic um, background paper. And it's huge. And so I just keep cutting chunks out of it and then using it for other paintings and things like that. So you can see I've got my metallics in here. I've got all kinds of great stuff going on in here. And I just love these backgrounds because I can absolutely just go wild with color and technique. And then the best part about stuff like that is that I can cut out and edit just the parts that I want to save. So if you actually have a um, mat board, um, stand by. Let me show you something. So I'm going to go grab a mat board because I think I have one. have one okay so mat boards are great for isolating and finding um, special areas within your paintings so actually let me hold tilt this down better so that you can see I'm not sure what the best way to do this is so that you can see um, but let's just assume it's going to be like this so I can move this around like a little window and I can isolate great little areas, right? I could isolate great little areas and then select those as my paintings. In fact, this gives me a really good idea because I have, I've painted this all in one go, obviously. Um, and then I've been ripping it up and using it for other things, but I have a whole pile of these mat boards and every little window that I'm finding, there we go, every little window that I'm finding is really beautiful. Like it doesn't matter where I move it. I have these great little things happening. So with all these mat boards, I could actually cut out my sections and have a whole series of little paintings, which I just might do. Um, anyway, so yeah, so once you have these, let me just show you how I would do that actually. So in finding your area, you can see that this paper is very, um, like it, it hasn't been treated very nicely. I think what I did was actually when it was wet, I had put it down on top of, um, some black paper and when the, the moisture actually seeped through and then that's what happened is I, then I had to peel it off the table or off the piece of paper so that's why I've got all these holes in it but I was still able to rescue it so it's no matter to me I, it was still um, really fun making it so again for those of you joining us Friday this is what we're doing right so um, I know M Amelia's on the chat today and so that's why I I made the title of Friday um, Amelia needs to let loose because she made me laugh 
and inspired this whole project for Friday when after painting those tedious little eyes she said that was fun now I need to go and let loose and I thought you know what I think maybe we all need to let loose because the project was super fun and super intense and we just need now to just do the opposite and just go crazy so um, so I'll, I'll give you a step-by-step -step, like now is this do this make a mark do this so that you'll be able to hear me in uh, in the back of your mind by the time you play that like 10 times over um, which will be good for helping you move forward to loosen up especially when making backgrounds because to me like I said I've got a lot of little paintings and areas in here that I find really interesting so I'm going to continue to work with these a little bit so how would I do that so the opening of that mat is five by seven so I could go around and I could pick where I I want it to be um, but like I said I, I have a lot of great areas in here and I'm not just saying that because it's um, uh, you know I, I'm tooting my own horn here about how wonderful my painting is but the reality is there's a lot of great stuff and this was all done as a loosening up technique um, before a workshop so I was in a workshop one time and before painting the painting the teacher wanted us to just do like like get loose and and be loose with our brush strokes and all that and it was really fun because there wasn't any goal in mind and so well, now I'm looking at it and I'm like that's really beautiful because there's a lot of interesting things going on in that um, one of the things that I should tell you about is that I use sandpaper in here and I didn't put that on your list of supplies so anybody who's watching on Friday you should definitely have a piece of sandpaper handy or a sanding block because that's going to be really great for us okay so that's a five by seven and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a pencil underneath and give myself a mark so I know how big I need to make it there we go and I'm just going to trim that up so again using the same technique and this one's full of holes so it's fun so I'll be able to show you how I'm going to mount this first so as long as it's bigger than the um, actual mat I don't need to be I don't need to concern myself too much with what size specifically so the last one I did 8 by 10 right it was being specific to um, painting on a piece of paper and that was later on going to be sold just as that piece of paper so now here's a little bit there's a little bit off the edge of this one that would be fine if I just glued it behind that mat board but see what happens when I take this off I actually have a fantastic other little piece of collage here now that I can use in something else so it's completely a waste not want not so if I take this project and I would just put this on the bottom like this look at how great that is all of a sudden right so I've got this very interesting very unique very um, intuitive piece of collage that came as a cutoff of something else so always have like a little I have a little those little plastic shoe boxes everywhere and I can show you what I mean I have these little plastic shoe boxes everywhere with bits of collage in them and it's just little stuff that I've cut off of other pieces that later on become really integral to um, to some of the pieces uh, to the rest of the artwork so having hand handmade papers within your work is um, Amelia says is that watercolor paper or a bond paper roll um, that would be the thing that this was from so if it's from this one here this was actually a piece of um, uh, it's definitely not watercolor paper it was made on the cheapest paper possible because we were supposed to throw these out afterwards so this was our loosening up technique in that workshop that I was in and then um, everybody just pitched them after they were done and I'm the one who decided to like I said I laid mine on another paper so that I could take it home and I did and everybody at the workshop kind of laughed at me because it was like the junk and then I took mine home with me and I put a board on top of it and pressed it flat but it actually bonded to the black paper behind and the black paper was just um, 
what do you call this? A bristle board. So um, it actually bonded to that because of how wet it was and everything else. So that's why when I peeled it off, you see all kinds of holes and rips and tears. So I don't mind it at all. It's actually a really nice piece to have. And like I said, these little off cuts, keep them because they will be really important to you later on and um, they can help. Um, how do I want to say this? They can minimize the commercialness of your collage. So here's the thing that I, I appreciate about collage is that we can find some great images out there. Um, we have the the ability to go on the internet and take whatever images we want and I mean provided you're using copyright free stuff you can use scrap of papers we can use napkins we can use tissue paper we have so many great um, graphics and commercial images that are available and it's a fantastic time to be making mixed media art um, because we just have so much available to us but I would caution you that without a nice little balance of some handmade stuff, it can tend to look a little on the scrapbook side, right? As opposed to, um, oh, okay, that's a great question, Amelia. Um, but anyway, so I'll, I'll just finish this thought. So it's, um, I think without the element of having your own handmade pieces in there and elements and images and things like that, I think that there's a certain amount of, um, yeah, a little, a certain amount of that, of, of you missing from that painting. So if, uh, I guess that's a better word to, to use in that is that people want to see you in your art, right? They want to know what you have, what life you've breathed into that piece. So if all you're using is commercial images and, and napkins, and trust me, I use a ton of them, um, it's... It needs to have a nice little balance of you okay so your hand needs to be seen your um, sensibilities need to be seen your isms as I always say needs to be seen so so if you're a scratcher if you're a tear backer if you're a you know heavy painter if you're a gouger whatever it is that needs to be seen in every single painting you do so um, and that's what our Thursdays are more about right which is the the fun having the fun back in our paintings so Amelia is wondering about um, because I was talking about Friday so Friday being big it depends how you want to work so let me flip this up so I can chat with you guys so this big piece was just um, bond paper and so it's just like a really cheap piece of paper and then it was actually taped to the wall so this was in a studio so the woman didn't mind paint on her wall which is why i'm i'm not suggesting that um everybody goes ahead and and destroys walls um but if you have you know what's really good to work on is like um I like thinner papers because I can reuse them more easily. I'm going to show you a heavier poster mounting that, but it's a bit more challenging to mount something that is sealed to a board. Um, so any type of paper will work. If you don't have anything, even fabric works because like I said, rolled up canvas is really great because you can just lay it out and then you can put some kind of a tarp down. You can put a plastic tablecloth, you can put anything. So it, it the, the difference will be is if you're working flat or if you're working vertically. So either one's fine. Um, if you're working flat on a table, on the floor, it doesn't matter. Put something plastic down first because you might, you know, spill outside. If you're very careful about staying within the confines, then be prepared to trim it off. So if it's on paper, make sure that you don't want to go outside of that if you're worried about the wall or the floor or the table or everything else. So um, I have rolls of um, unstretched canvas that I work on sometimes when I want to work big and flat and messy. I sometimes just work on bond paper. Um, it just depends if I want to have it vertical. So if I want to have it vertical, because I like to do a lot of my background sometimes vertically because of the dripping and stuff like that, it just, I don't know, it lends itself better um, for me, but it doesn't matter. You can still work face down. Um, then a, a great thing to do is if you have a big piece of 
plywood or paneling or anything else or a piece of drywall or anything I know it's not easy to just get these things but if you have something or you know a neighbor or somebody who has a piece of junk lying around what I do with that is I actually just tape my stuff to that board and I just lean the board against the wall so uh, yeah so I'll, I'll talk about that in one second so um, that was on my agenda I, we'll get back to it so the um, that's what I would suggest is that if you have something that you can actually tape it to that would provide a rigid surface for you to put it on so I have this old um, Okay, so Amelia is giving you guys a good tip. She says, if you're using thin paper, such as tissue or rice paper, put it on textured garbage bags, the flex ones. I want to see this. Oh, see more. Why won't it let me see more? See more. See more. It's not letting me see more. Uh, oh, wait, there we go. They're easy to peel off. Yeah, true. So um, I'm not sure about tissue paper or rice paper is going to work for Friday's class unless you're doing that in addition to what we're doing. Um, so because you won't be able to put enough layers on without the paper itself falling apart. So that's actually a good uh, a good point. So if you want to make some additional papers on the side, like on tissue or rice, keep that as a side project because the one piece that we're working on or however many pieces you're working on it's in the comfort of your own studio but it should have a bit more body to it so that we can um, so that we can really give it the the paint and the layers and that sort of thing so tissue is a bit too too soft for our purposes we want to be able to just really get in there and and um, um, yeah layer things on okay and then scratch through it and stuff like that and the tissue will just tear so, but you've given me a good idea because we could do that on another workshop is we could just make lots of papers because I make so many papers sometimes and just leave them scattered everywhere. And then when they're dry and I stack them all up and press them flat, they're just so amazing to have all these papers made. Okay, so getting back to, Sophie wanted me to get back to gluing heavier board to, um, or a heavier poster or cardstock or something like that. So there are two different kinds of heavy paper. Um, one would be that it is sealed, it's shiny, and the other is that it's just heavy and matte. So this is a, 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 what do want, a printmaking paper, which is similar to like a watercolor paper. So it has got a cotton base to it and it's very, very matte which means it's absorbent, okay? This one, which is just a commercial poster, is very shiny and it's all sealed. This is more challenging to glue than this because this is very absorbent, this is not absorbent. So in order to make this one absorbent, there's a few things we can do. I'll tilt my screen back down and I'll show you what I do. I'm just going into my out of sight here for a second and I'm grabbing a little piece of sandpaper so on the back I'm going to rough up the surface so that's going to create in different directions that's going to create open pores in the back so basically these papers have been glossed they've been sprayed with a sealant and so we need to make little grooves in that sealant so that our water can actually get into and reach the paper itself. There we go. So now that we have that opened up um, Oh yeah, like running so low on water. I have no idea why. I don't just go fill it. But when I spray this with water, there we go. 
you can see that the water is now being absorbed into the paper and it's relaxing. If I just put it on the, um, on, and you, now you can see it kind of bleeding through, which is good. That's exactly what we wanted because on this side, it's still nice and protected, but the fact that it's curling actually means it's absorbing the water. If it wasn't curling and the water was just beating off, that would mean that it's not being absorbed. But the fact that it's curling means this is a, this is a really good thing. It means it's like soaking up the water. Okay. So we'll let it do its little curly thing. And then I'll get a board, which all I have is this small one. So we'll work with that. So again, you're going to position this on however you want it. I'm going to make sure that these little hearts line up equal on both sides. There we go. I'm going to weight it down in the middle. Lock my knife. Cut through. Remember, or you could just trace with a pencil and then cut it with a straight edge afterwards. There we go. I don't think I cut through all the way. Perfect. Okay. So now an interesting thing about this cardboard or this paper is it's two sided. So when I put the water in, look at that, I'm able to actually separate and take off that layer. So that's not always possible, but it's just like double sided scrapbook paper. So sometimes when you wet double sided scrapbook paper, the same thing will happen the other bits on the other side, once the water goes in, will separate that glue. So right at the beginning, I think Rhonda was asking me, I think it was Rhonda, was asking me about um, why adding the white glue to the wallpaper paste. It's because that's how they even adhere two pieces of paper together, right? It's with strippable um, glue, so that when it gets wet, the two things come apart. So now we actually have a much easier paper to deal with which this doesn't always happen. This is a little bonus, um, but we'll take it. But the key on the glossy one, remember, is the sanding first and then spraying it with water. So now what I'm doing is I'm applying the glue to glue. Again, letting it nice thick coat. We don't really have um, the option here of going too thin. You want to have a nice thick coat. Uh, and the reason for that is if we have too thin a coat, you might end up with an air bubble and that will be such a pain in the middle of this thing to have an air bubble. So now I'm putting on good thick coat because don't forget the board is so absorbent right now and it's sucking up a lot of the moisture. The paper not as much because we've already pre wet it with water, but it still is um, absorbing some, which is why I did the board secondly, because it's really thirsty and it's really absorbing that. So now I'm just going to place this on top and then I'm going to find my brayer starting from the middle and I'm going to keep rotating it, push from the center out. go. All right, awesome. And then wipe that off. I'm going to take the excess off of there, grab my paper towel, and then clean up the sides. Baby wipes also work well. Just be careful of your image because it is soggy and baby wipes can destroy your image depending on the ink. This is a commercial poster, so it's probably not going to do anything because it's been sealed. There we go. Remove that, remove that. And then the key is to let that dry, right? So um, because this one's glossy, I'm going to go ahead in this whole dry process and I'm going to show you kind of the next way I would start this one. So I might as well leave it with a little bit of the um, Liquitex Clear Gesso on it. Okay. And 
it is actually this is courtesy of my studio mate Maria who was so nice to message me last night and because she was watching the video and saw that I was out of gesso so she said I could go in her studio and use some of her gesso so thank you Maria because now it's much easier for me to illustrate um, the Liquitex clear gesso when I actually have some to work with so the Liquitex clear gesso and lots of companies make clear gesso but Liquitex is my favorite brand um, and I don't work for them they don't work for me nothing like that this is just a purely it is a beautiful product when this dries it takes out all that shine and it provides a really good toothy surface for any type of paint to sit on top and I say any because um, at this point if you've actually got a decent enough coat of Liquitex clear gesso on there um, you can actually even uh, work with encaustic on top of here even though it was a glossy surface previously it has lots of tooth and it will hold on to a pretty good amount of wax and then um, I hope you guys are paying attention to a lot of Amelia's uh, comments because Amelia is a fantastic encaustic artist and uh, and teacher I understand she's going to be starting doing videos as well so very soon I'll be uh, helping to to send people her way for classes but um, in the meantime she's offering you guys lots of great tips and lots of great suggestions especially when it comes to um, encaustic and microcrystalline and all that kinds of stuff so when when Amelia is making comments pay attention because she's uh, she's great and she's super helpful to be helping in the, the comments in the chats especially when I can't see and and um, read everything while I'm doing that anyway so the reason I've gone back and forth is because I'm trying to get rid of the grain I don't know if you can see it but Liquitex clear gesso isn't exactly a hundred percent clear um, so you want to have it nice and thin and if you do have white brush strokes in it they will dry as 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 uh, white brush strokes um, and ridges so we do want the the uh, grittiness of it but when this is dry it'll be completely clear because it's in a thin enough coat and I've gotten rid of any brush strokes that are visible but it's going to feel like sandpaper and that's great because anything I want to do on top of it will stick much nicer than that than to that glossy surface okay so that is how I would handle a heavy <coughs> heavier board and I have one more thing I don't know where how we're doing for time I always have this sense when all in an hour is up now okay so the last thing I wanted to really show you is so this one we did earlier right so this is the very first one we did we mounted it to board and what happens when paper is wet so when we put the glue on and when we put the water on and I did all these things the paper actually stretches and then when you glue it it comes back a little bit but not as much as when you've got like soaking wet paint and stuff on it which is why it curls and wrinkles and does all that stuff but now this is mounted it, it's been about a well 40 minutes 45 minutes and it's pretty dry so I'm going to show you how to finish up your edges because there's I don't know if you guys can see this but there's like a little bit of paper right on the edge of that one and that's because of the shrink and the and the expansion and stuff like that so I could trim it up with a blade by putting it face down and then trimming it up but to get the best fit I find is to have a sanding block or a good piece of sandpaper and to go downwards so I take this one and I go downwards and I cut the paper you can only do this when it's dry and that really forces the paper down into the edges and incorporates it and prevents any um, lifting there we go so I'm actually just cutting the paper I'm going to turn this a little bit I'm just cutting the paper 
with the sandpaper and at the same time really forcing it into those edges. Still a little wet, but it's not bad. So if it's too wet, your paper is just going to tear, like kind of like that piece. And if you're like me, as I dubbed myself a long time ago, the queen of good enough, that doesn't bother me. But if that's going to bother you and you want it precise, wait till it's fully dry. So cutting my edges nice and flat. Whoops, another tear. It's definitely still a bit too wet. Okay, now what I do is I use a little bit of white glue or Mod Podge or something like that. Let me get out my white glue. And I'm going to show you a little pro tip because we really want this to be stuck to the board. I go back in with my good old white glue, Mod Podge, whatever you got. Use a small brush. go use a small brush and then just go around and try and lift your edges if you can lift the edge there you go if we can lift the edge put the glue both on the paper and the board okay so again glue to glue if your edges won't lift then it's fully adhered you're not gonna have any issues but in my case because this is still a bit wet I've got a bit of um, issues on this corner, nothing. On that corner, just a little bit. My edges are fine, just that little tiny corner. Little glue to glue. And one more section over here is coming up. A little glue to glue, both on the paper, both on the board. All right, so that's all we need to do for that. And then I usually put a piece of um, paper on top of it. The only paper I have here is text, so I'm going to put this down. So I'm going to put something on there to protect that edge. And then I'm going to use my brayer or my credit card or whatever I find first. And I'm going to push out. So the paper protects it and it also prevents the glue from getting on this side, which would have me smearing it all across the top of my painting. So I'm going to go around. I'm going to get all my edges that I added a bit of glue there we go now I'm going to use a baby wipe if I can find one I need a studio assistant who loves to clean that's my dream okay so there we go. So I am going to wipe off any excess glue that came out of there. There won't be a lot because I was just careful to get it in the same area. But now I know that later on when I'm working on this piece, my edges aren't going to lift. Okay, so that is a perfectly adhered piece of background that we made on paper is now completely incorporated into um, my panel and so now I have this ready to go and I can continue now like I said to collage and to paint and to do whatever I want on top I can turn this into a painting now all right so that's it for today um, thank you for joining me for Technique Tuesday um, the um, integration like I said of, of working on paper into your pieces or just finishing a piece is um, I don't know it's it's integral to my practice anyway so um yeah so if you guys are wondering about storage issues for paintings moving on here on um out especially seeing as we're still locked down we're still doing this every single day if you're having fun if you're practicing if you're making lots of things maybe you don't always want to make it on a board you might just want to work on paper and then later on turn them into paintings which is completely feasible, completely viable option and um, takes up a lot less space. 
Um, I guess that's it till tomorrow. So tomorrow, um, you guys can ask me a lot of your wax questions and stuff because tomorrow's Waxing Wednesdays. And uh, like I said, so if you guys are also paying attention and you ask questions and I don't get back to you right away, um, I'll try to address them during the talk. And if I don't get to them during the talk, um, uh, then pay attention to your fellow tribers who are paying attention and who are giving you really good advice because these ladies have lots of experience and um, lots of really good information so if you ask the question and I don't get back to you please um, note that your tribers are there for you and they're helping support you and your practice and so the uh, if there's something that I notice is you know a little bit um, uh, I could further on that then I will further on that but otherwise thank you to everybody who keeps helping each other and uh, we are totally totally building this awesome, awesome little group. Okay, talk to you tomorrow, guys. Bye-bye.